I want to thank the organizers for the opportunity to speak today at the meeting. Uh, I'm going to focus the discussion today on a program that we call On10, which is a second generation liposomal uh, vaccine that targets the tumor associate, associated antigen MUC1. Um, I'm going to go ahead and skip through our uh, safe harbor statement as well. <laughs> I won't bore you with it. <laughs> um, before I jump into a discussion of MUC1 uh, um, uh, vaccines, I'd like to first uh, present a, a little background on MUC1 as a target for cancer vaccines. <clears throat> uh, MUC1 is a uh, plasma membrane associated protein, it's heterodimeric. It's uh, composed of an uh, intracellular domain that's linked non covalently to a uh, um, extracellular domain that comp is comprised by a series of tandem repeats that are highly glycosylated. Um, in normal tissue, MUC1 is principally expressed in ductal epithelium, um, and the uh, highly uh, glycosylated protein is proposed to play a role in uh, a protective barrier in uh, glandular epithelium. Uh, in tumor tissue, however, uh, the MUC1 is hypoglycosylated relative to normal tissue. Uh, this exposes the, the polypeptide backbone uh, and really creates a unique antigen that uh, um, can be recognized by the human immune system. Uh, MUC1 is broadly expressed in uh, epithelial-derived cancers as well as some selected hematological malignancies. Uh, it's also oncogenic. It's been shown to interact with receptor tyrosine kinases and contribute to both cell proliferation as well as survival and metastasis, and cancers that have high expression of MUC1 have been shown to have a poor prognosis clinically. Um, patients that have a pre-existing immune response to MUC1 have shown uh, to have better outcomes clinically in a variety of cancers, including non-small cell lung cancer, breast, pancreatic, and ovarian and gastric cancers. So based on uh, the observation that patients are already mounting an immune response to MUC1 at some level, uh, multiple uh, uh, companies and individuals have moved forward with vaccines targeting MUC1 uh, in the clinic. Our first generation MUC1 vaccine is called Stimivax. Uh, Oncotherian uh, was once a company called Biomira, which had a long history of cancer vaccine development, and Stimivax was developed by the scientists at Biomira. In a phase two clinical uh, trial, a subset of patients with stage 3B and stage 3 non-small cell lung cancer showed a remarkable um, improvement in survival, a 17-month survival advantage relative to placebo. Some of these patients are alive eight years uh, after the initiation of the trial. Uh, this survival curve was recapitulated in a phase 1-2 uh, uh, formulation comparability study, further supporting the idea that patients with this stage of disease uh, may be uh, uh, treated with uh, Stimivax. Based on this idea, a global phase three trial was initiated in December 2006 and is currently being run by our partner, Merck KGAA, in non-small cell lung cancer. So it was our uh, interest to make a, a second generation uh, MUC1 targeted cancer vaccine that would be uh, distinguished from Stimivax in a couple of ways. Uh, first off, uh, Stimivax does not produce an antibody response to MUC1. It's entirely a T cell driven response and we wanted to create a vaccine that would bring to bear both the humoral as well as the cellular um, arms of the immune system. And secondly, we wanted to use a glycopeptide um, antigen in, in our vaccine. Uh, the rationale for doing this is, is a couple fold. First off, patient antibodies to MUC1 principally recognize a hypoglycosylated protein, not the naked peptide backbone. And we wanted to, to generate a, a, a pronounced antibody response to the antigen. <clears throat> Secondly, preclinical data had shown that a glycosylated peptide was more effective in a human MUC1 transgenic mouse at breaking immune tolerance, suggesting that uh, there's an opportunity for improve, improved immune benefit in patients with this kind of construct. Uh, the second point that distinguishes on 10 from Stimivax is we've incorporated a novel uh, lipid A adjuvant that we call uh, PET lipid A. This is a fully synthetic product that shows improved potency relative to natural derived uh, lipid A adjuvants. Uh, this slide shows the structure of PET lipid A contrasted to uh, monophosphoryl lip lipid A. Uh, like MPL, <clears throat> PET lipid A is the uh, detoxified form of, L of the lipid A component of LPS. It interacts uh, with TLR4 uh, to activate antigen presenting cells. Uh, however, this is a fully synthetic product, uh, which uh, leads to 
uh, improved uh, manufacturing, eliminating lot-to-lot -lot variability, and allowing better quality control over the end product. Um, in addition, PET-Lipid A is much more potent than MPL at stimulating pro-inflammatory cytokines. This is probably due to the purity of the product. It's entirely 6-acyl derivative, where MPL is a mixture of, of the 6-acyl as well as 4- and 5-acyl cogeners. So um, the next slide is just a demonstration of the improved potency of PET-Lipid A relative to MPL. This is an induction of IL-6 and TNF in vitro using human P PBMCs. You can see there's roughly a tenfold improvement in potency of PET-Lipid A over MPL. We think this uh, improved uh, potency could be important in the context of cancer vaccines where stimulating a strong immune response to uh, uh, breach tolerance is important. Uh, in addition to the uh, uh, PET-Lipid A component, uh, the, the peptide that we're using for on 10 is very different from Stimuvax. Here I show uh, the on 10 peptide, which we call M40TN6, contrasted with M25, uh, which is our designation for the peptide used in Stimuvax. Um, the on 10 um, peptide is 43 amino acids, which gives, I think, more diver epitopic diversity for a class one and class two presentation. We've incorporated the Galnac residues at multiple positions, which are glycosylated in uh, tumor, MUC1. Uh, we've also incorporated two uh, lipid serines at the C-terminus to embed the peptide in the liposome. Uh, the two liposirines we've shown improves the stability of the peptide in the liposome and leads to an enhanced humoral response relative to a single lipid chain, which was used in the Stimuvax peptide. Uh, in the next uh, series of data slides, I'm going to show you, uh, in some cases, we, we compare the activity of ONT10 to a vaccine we call ONT25, which uses the M25 uh, peptide, the same one used in Stimuvax, but includes our PET-Lipid-A adjuvant instead of MPL. Uh, the current formulation uh, is a lyophilized mixture um, that includes the peptide as well as PET-Lipid-A in a carrier, carrier lipid composition that's identical to Stimuvax. It's shown consistent particle size, chemical composition, and reconstitution properties across multiple research lots. Uh, the lyophilized product, as well as reconstituted products, show excellent stability at multiple temperature ranges, and we're currently moving forward with GMP production. Uh, this is an example of the induction of uh, interferon gamma response ex vivo. This is a recall assay using splenocytes from wild-type mice, showing induction of interferon gamma in both CD4 and CD8 splenocytes. At three different doses of ON10, we see robust induction of interferon gamma relative to a control peptide, <clears throat> indicating a principally a Th1 response induced by our vaccine. Uh, when we look at the antibodies induced by uh, ON10, we see a very potent induction of uh, IgGs that bind to the uh, uh, ON10 uh, peptide in ELISA assays. The 5, 25, and 100 microgram doses of ON10 produce antibody titers approaching uh, one to a million. <clears throat> The isotype analysis is consistent with the Th1 response. We're principally seeing IgG2b and IgG3 in the C57 black 6 background uh, with a lower production of IgG1 antibodies. And when we compare the induction of antibodies by ONT10 to ONT25, you see a much more pronounced antibody response. This is binding to the glycosylated peptide, and here is the titer of the um, uh, on 25 serum binding to the um, uh, M25 antigen. Uh, it's about a 50-fold difference in, in antibody induction. We were actually surprised that the um, M25 uh, um, or the On25 vaccine was producing an antibody response in mice because Stimuvax um, has never demonstrated a strong antibody response in mice. This could be due to the uh, uh, difference between using MPL or PET-Lipid A as an adjuvant. Uh, when we further characterized the antibodies um, uh, produced in the on immunized mice, we found that uh, they bound very robustly to uh, human MUC1 expressed in the mouse B16 melanoma cell line, um, with no binding above background to the parental cell line. Uh, we used an antibody called SM3, which binds to the peptide core of MUC1 as a positive control. Antibodies from on 25 immunized mice um, bound uh, much weaker to the uh, B16 MUC1 cells. Furthermore, when we uh, evaluated the ability of the antibodies to discriminate between a human mammary epithelial cell line or cell strain 
uh, compared to the T47D breast carcinoma, what we found is that the serum from MUC1 antibodies, or from what MUC1, an, the antibodies from MUC1 vaccinated mice showed very limited binding to the normal breast epithelial cell, uh, suggesting that the hyperglycosylated state of MUC1 in normal cells was preventing the antibody binding. Uh, two antibodies were used as a positive control that can bind to the hyperglycosylated MUC1, um, B2729, and an antibody from stem cell technologies to um, D14. Uh, the uh, SM3 antibody does not recognize normal MUC1. However, in the T47D, we see very strong binding of serum from the ontan immunized animals and also binding of the SM3 antibody, suggesting that we are really recognizing the tumor uh, hypoglycosylated uh, MUC1, but not the normal tissue MUC1. When we looked at uh, tumor derived cell lines, uh, we saw um, binding <coughs> to a panel of tumor derived cell lines that express MUC1, including MCF7, PANC1, and T47D, as shown on the previous slide but no binding to BXPC3 or MD, uh, MB453s, which do not express MUC1. Uh, when we evaluated uh, the activity of ONT10 in a tumor model, uh, in this case a B16 uh, a melanoma cell line expressing human MUC1, we saw a very pronounced inhibition of tumor growth in response to ONT10. At the end of the study, 9 out of 12 animals were tumor-free with greater than 99% tumor control, whereas the ONT25 immunized mice um, showed uh, strong tumor control, but less effective than um, the ONT10. There was no tumor control induced by the formulated PET lipid A by itself. Uh, the parental B16 tumors were not inhibited by uh, ONT10 or substantially by ONT25 either. In a second tumor model, uh, MC38, MC38, which is a colon adenocarcinoma cell line uh, designed to express human MUC1, we also saw a very pronounced inhibition of tumor growth induced by ONT10 vaccination, uh, less protection by ONT25, and again, no effect by the formulated adjuvant. So taken together, um, we believe the second generation vaccine provides uh, opportunity for improved immune response to MUC1. Uh, we believe this is uh, in, driven by the unique glycopeptide antigen structure, which we think will produce a robust antibody response that recognizes tumor MUC1. Um, and may be uh, more effective at breaking immune tolerance, as well as uh, our highly potent uh, novel lipid A adjuvant. We've seen encouraging preclinical results, um, combination of both cellular and humor immune, humoral immunity to MUC1, including induction of both the CD4 and CD8 response with a very high titer antibody response that discriminates between uh, normal tissue MUC1 and the tumor um, uh, MUC1. And this has led to potent suppression of MUC1 tumor growth. Uh, at this time, we don't know whether the superiority of ONT10 relative to ONT25 is due to the antibodies or the uh, unique antibody repertoire induced by the glycosylated antigen. Um, so far, the vaccine and formulated adjuvant are extremely well tolerated with limited uh, injection site inflammation and uh, no real systemic issues. And it's our goal to uh, move this into the clinic uh, by the end of this year. Um, before I finish, I'd like to thank uh, the people at Oncotherian that have made this happen, uh, including the research biology group uh, led by Kevin Klucher, including Rob Rosler, Rob Resendez, and Janelle Taylor, the uh, CMC group, which uh, comes under the Pharmaceutical Sciences Division, headed by our COO, Gary Christensen, and Sandy Coppinall and Jeff Millard, Brenda Christian and Linda Pistano are consultants that have helped us a lot with this program, and our clinical development uh, uh, leaders, Diana Hausman, who's VP of Clinical, and Larry Romel, Senior Director. And I'd be happy to take any questions at this time. Thank you very much. Okay. Who goes first? <laughs> Perhaps I, I missed it, but what was the timing of the immunization versus tumor challenge in the B16 model? Yeah, that was a preventative model, and uh, in that particular model, we were very conservative. We used a biweekly schedule of immunization starting, uh, I think, four weeks before we implanted the tumor cells, and so it was uh, uh, very effective at blocking tumor growth. We've since uh, evaluated a variety of schedules, and we see activity even in a therapeutic setting. Okay, no.
automobile system that caused some bad things. I'm sorry. So I think the question is, do you see an effect on the regulatory immune system from the cancer vaccine? So on T-regulatory cells or myeloid-derived suppressor Both cells? energy. Whatever. Yeah, we've, we've, uh, we've not seen any effect on at least uh, um, uh, T-regulatory cells isolated from the spleen. We've not investigated whether there's an increase in T-regs in tumor tissue or an increase in uh, myeloid suppressor cells. At least with MPL, and there is evidence, uh, certainly MPL will expand T-regulatory cells. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's something, uh, and some, some, some tumors will express, you know, toll like receptor, and, and uh, right. the effect on the tumor itself may be what you don't really want to see using, you know, toll like right, receptor. Right, right. We, we've seen no evidence, at least in the, in the spleen, the splenic compartment. Um, and, and one thing I should point out is, is when the, the uh, Lipid A is formulated in this liposome. There's very little free material. Uh, it's, it's really only released upon phagocytosis. So I think it's really happening in the antigen presenting cell environment. So I don't think there's going to be a lot of systemic <clears throat> exposure to the, the lipid A molecule.